Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for the invitation to uh, comment on one of the chapters of Lutz's book. Uh, it's an honor, um, and I have enjoyed the previous meeting. Uh, um, this was very helpful in understanding. Uh, at least I have gone over some of the uh, slides a number of times. I think I got something that is worthwhile telling. One of the things that happened background the speaker is it says that my background is mathematics that is correct I went up to the PhD uh, exam in mathematics with not and the reason for that was that I understood that I was not really mathematical but only somebody uh, educated in mathematics. So in the rest of my career, I didn't go into uh, mathematics except that I used it whenever necessary. Um, and I became something which is not unique, but at least rare, which is uh, a professor in research method. Actually, a number of uh, disciplines, and my interest is and has always been in trying to help and support my own, but also other people's okay. studies. Um, so, in that sense, um, I thought it was useful to comment on uh, chapter 10 in terms. Uh, method, uh, and mainly I must admit because I found it very difficult that in the beginning to understand uh, the text. And I mean, in the beginning um, when we started this series, um, many words are used that I am uh, unfamiliar with. Uh, in my area of research methods. For example, the notion of expectation, of course, is well known in the area of statistics, but it's not used in that sense. So I had, one of the things I had to do was to understand what the different terms uh, actually meant. And that is part of my um, uh, contribution also I thought it useful to identify a number of issues uh, in the different uh, subsections of the chapter. Uh, I have given uh, a number of quotes from the chapter. And my intention is to, uh, at the end, to give an interpretation of and identify uh, what I think might have been a number of questions that we were asking. Uh, there are two parts to my contribution. One is that I go over probably relatively quickly of quotes, then I identify a number of issues that I think are important, then I try to deal with them. So, that's the reason I call uh, this contribution questions and our answers. The questions were relatively clear uh, after reading the book, uh, but the answers weren't. So I put in and or just to indicate that I had some difficulty with it. So I started with monism and first of dualism. Um, in this uh, quote, um, it says there have been some exchanges and interactions among expectations. Well, apparently, expectation is something that can be formulated, that has a shape, that has a function, and that are uh, 
that contributes to something that is cultural. Um, so those two elements I thought relevant. Uh, the second the card passage uh, had a lot of interesting issues in it. But the major one that I think relevant is this notion that the I becomes a special subject, that it is not an inference from something else, but it is the beginning. And that is something that I think extremely important. It has to do with many of the uh, research and when many of the studies where uh, the researcher is actually uh, has to uh, become aware of the fact that he is situated in a particular body. Um, are identified as providing meanings to things and events and to be part of a second continuity. Um, so the important part here is that if that second contingency, to deal with the second contingency, uh, we must part partake, participate in the social reconstruction uh, of the uh, meanings that exist in this movement. And the major point here is that it's the problem of domain of the social science of humanity. I think that an extremely important point that is being made, um, because it means that we, and it's emphasized in, in the chapter as well, that we are not talking about biology or physics. Um, Meaning is a very important concept in technology. In the book, of course, it takes a wider issue, but I thought it useful to point out that um, somebody actually um, put it as a basic concept in a particular discipline. Um, I haven't had a lot of interaction with Luhmann. I invited him in 1980, before he was in, uh, famous, uh, in a meeting for, of three weeks. And we had a lot of discussions and uh, jokes. Um, and maybe I have let, contributed a little bit to his later work, but I really never understood what he was talking about, probably because I'm not a sociologist. And actually, I've never been a sociologist and, and a methodologist in sociology. Um, one of the things that is important um, in one of the to answer one of the questions that there is um, a distinction identified in a discourse uh, that specifies an observational category. So the notion of meaning to me uh, is linked to the notion of an observational category, but possibly mainly to the notion of a category. Uh, and the, the observation in standard uh, research, of course, is determined uh, empirically and mainly by measurement, because measurement is actually only possible uh, that's a claim that I make. Um, it's only possible when the observational category can be well defined and the mapping onto some theory can be closed. Then we come to the point of the redundancy. Uh, a major aspect of redundancy is um, that there are more of them in the same situation. Quotes refer to horizons of meaning, and of course, these horizons can, can differ, uh, even given the same information. Um, on the other hand, you have to do something with the codes. Uh, you have to order them. You have to identify their relations. The problem that is 
identified over here is that it's not actually possible to categorize codes. Categorize uh, means that it is possible to map it a set uh, exhaustively on some statement. Uh, but the codes are open statements, so you can order them, but you cannot categorize them. Um, and the final one, uh, an interesting question to me, to what extent are the directions in science inevitable and to what extent can these mold, mold, molded by conscious policy? In my uh, work, I think I would say that um, science advances, advances are not inevitable, but they are steered by previous developments. Um, so, for example, when Galileo published his work, it was simply about a single observer and all the observations were his observations. Only later did people start to ask questions about um, generalization and about the possibility of having different observers and different things. Um, the main point next that is um, uh, the notion of uh, direction of the codes in terms of some regime is the question where does uh, uh, evolution, um, well, where does, uh, uh, where does science evolve? And what he is saying is that it's in something that is called knowledge. So on the level of the regime, something is being produced that is knowledge. And given the fact that it's being discussed and interacted with, uh, it, knowledge is involved, it's involved uh, evolving rather than the product. Um, and the last point, of course, is uh, direct consequence. Uh, from these quotes, I, I have given you my interpretation of the quote. From this quote, I went back to uh, asking myself, what is it that Lutz would like to have done? Can I identify what his uh, problems are? And so I have three questions um, that I hope are a little bit linked to what he tried to do. Uh, but it's not stated explicitly, so I had to use my uh, experience. The first one, uh, what's the relation between information and meaning? Um, it comes frequently up in the text, and it is uh, a core element, I think, of the book. Um, and there is an answer, and I think that what we can use as an answer is that once you have information and send it to a receiver, the receiver is actually not given a particular distribution or observation, but is given a way of representation. So it stimulates a way of representation. Um, that means that information actually uh, stimulates the development of meaning. And once we have meaning as such a representation, we have to be able to select some of them in terms of what it is that we would consider knowledge. What is the nature of social theory? Um, it contributes to the construction of the uh, delicate of a relation between social theory. And I think it's very important to realize that one of the main objectives is to actually uh, specify a measurement theory. Um, but of course, not for the whole theory, as I will argue later, but only for some parts of it. Um, and that means for the work as Lute actually frequently emphasizes it has to be done. Um, the second part is this notion of the second contingency. 
that's important as part of the social theory. And um, they make it possible to actually introduce a further level of selection and make globalization at the regime level possible. The final question that I have what is the form of this process of knowledge? I have looked um, in many of the papers and I have looked at the internet. Um, but the notion of discursive uh, in my world does not have a fixed meaning. Um, so I had to give a number of answers. And the first one, of course, is that there is an element of redundancy. So there is more than one in parallel to others. Um, what you are trying to do in uh, exploring um, options is that you try to identify rationalized expectations um, as something that is independent of individuals or individual actors. Uh, the rationalization specifies is a specifies code which backs uh, and regulate uh, and also makes it possible to identify uh, what is novelty or what is innovation. And then uh, with the coding of the communications, the medium of communication knowledge. So I assume that that is uh, what we are talking about. So. This was a quick overview, overview of what I think um, is relevant to um, to the chapter, but it raised another question, and the question is, of course, the uh, relevant to the last one: What is that knowledge that? we are now uh, talking about. Um, it has to do with culture. It has to do with uh, discourse. It has to do with people talking to each other. So there is interaction. Um, there is feedback. There is selection. So is it the type of knowledge that we usually consider knowledge, like physics, the knowledge in physics? Um, when I, I'm, talk, I'm not talking about quantum mechanics, but I'm talking about traditional physics, like uh, Newton developed, for example. Um, and where uh, we can identify that um, it is possible to collect data and to uh, map them onto some theory such that in uh, more data, there usually is some type of convergence. Um, you know, uh, the, the Planck constant, uh, I think at the moment has something like 27 decimals and every year there is another one, but it's a convergent process, even though at any moment uh, it may fail, at this moment in time, it is convergent. So, in the course of time, in the research methods, convergence is usually assumed. Um, I think I will stop this if you don't mind, because I don't have uh, uh, any other. Um... What you see, but anyway, um, I'm continuing. I don't know how to go back to my cell. Gerard, what do you want to do? I don't want this yellow uh, frame. Uh, okay. Have, have you? Have, have you have you stopped you have you stopped presenting? Yes, no, not okay. stopped presenting, but stopped slides. Okay. And um, are you looking <laughs> for something or do you just want no. to go to Zoom? You no, just I will I just want 
um, to continue with my lecture or my contribution uh, with visually. With yeah, okay. At, at the top of your screen, it says somewhere, stop sharing. Um, That's and, and you just have to cancel the sharing or alternatively, I'll see whether I can, as a host, actually um, do the stop sharing for you. Um, allow to stop participants sharing. Okay, ah, yes. Ah, that's it, yes. Very good. So we fix that, yeah. <laughs> So continue. Yes, no, I will continue, but yeah. I will now have in front of me um, a picture of myself and uh, the gallery of everybody else. So that's what I was looking for. Um, so the question, um, the type of knowledge that I think is intended has a number of properties. Um, and what it has to uh, include, of course, is the function of the redundancy in my world means that you have a number of alternatives and they have the same value of the same function as when they share something without me knowing what. Next one is, of course, that what it, what they share is the notion of intention. It must be, it must include something about intention because um, we are talking about contributing to culture and a description of what is the cultural layer. And also they must uh, contribute something in the present because um, in the different um, environment, it is noted that the present is actually going to channel the behavior of individuals and individuals to achieve uh, certain um, objectives and intentions. So I would say that the code that um, actually is forming uh, what is being talked about is that we are talking about instructions or advice about scenarios, there is a whole area of scenario development, schemas, but in essence, what we are talking about is a method. So uh, in, in these terms, I think that Luhmann actually was asking um, for methods in the, for a social theory in the form of methods. Now the methods of course have, um, are well known and we all know them uh, and they have a very important role in society. All organizations are dealing with methods or strategies. Governments have plans, um, precedents have intentions. So word is very widely known. The major problem with uh, intentions and uh, instruction is of course that um, as a single term, they have a lot of drawbacks. Um, it's, they are easy to uh, turn into ideologies. Uh, they are usually what we call group thinking. So they develop in groups and people stick to them. Um, and they also have a tendency to make it possible to control individuals because uh, in an intention, in, in an instruction, you have this notion of um, identifying what it is you want to put together. And identifying what it is to, you want to put together is, of course, a form of control. You say, this is what you must do. Uh, so, given the fact that uh, there are so many uh, disadvantages to instructions, it seemed to me that um, in the book by Lut, an alternative is being presented that reduces these disadvantages. For example, if you are talking about frame, uh, redundancy, 
it means that you say for every uh, instruction you have to have an alternative. So many alternatives make it possible not to go into group thinking and also make it possible for a group to be resilient and to shape whatever it is that they try to do um, in terms of their intentions and their uh, shared or rather agreed intentions. So in redundancy is a very important property of any type of research that tries to improve on uh, instructions. The second part is that instructions, of course, are not um, human dependent. They are, in fact, human independent. So an instruction uh, can be given to anybody. And many of the uh, in sets of instructions that people have developed have become something like a frame. So my favorite example is the Euclidean geometry, which developed from a set of uh, Egyptian instructions into a frame where there are many different uh, strategies or instructions to do different things with different intentions, but they all are linked together, not in the, in the form of a categorization, but in the form of each of the instruction uh, being able to justify another one. So the point that I'm making is that the things that we have, for example, Boolean algebra, uh, Bayesian networks, uh, geometry, algebra, uh, artificial intelligence, are actually not descriptions of what humans are able to do, but are channels within which uh, humans uh, are supported to do certain things that they wish to do. Um, an important aspect of that type of thing is, of course, that you can switch from one frame to another, reframing. A uh, very well-known example, of course, is the example of uh, Solomon in the Bible, uh, where he has to decide about uh, which mother um, deserves the baby, the, which they both claim. And, of course, uh, the interesting thing is that he makes it possible to go from a situation where there are two claims, and you might think of a, a game theory, but he switches to something else. He switches to an experimental situation where he says, I have a sword, and if I cut the baby in half, um, I would and satisfy. And of course, that generates uh, the response of one of the women uh, mothers um, and that she prefers the other woman to have the baby. And that solves, in a sense, the problem. So it's very important in terms of strategies and sets of strategies that they all identify local resources. Here is where Descartes comes in. All strategies are localized. You must be able to identify what it is that you use as um, a resource and these resources may, of course, uh, become stable. They may become something that uh, exists over time and can be used by other people and so on and so on. So um, I think that this is the type of thing that I would consider to be discursive, discursive knowledge. This raises the question, of course, um, in the book, uh, Lut is not um, trying to identify how you uh, acquire discursive knowledge. So um, he des describes how it is, for example, created uh, in terms of peer reviews, interactions between different scientists, government, application, the people who apply the uh, knowledge. So there is an issue where you can say, how would I actually go from a single instruction to a multiple instruction and even to frames or regimes in those terms? Well, the two parts, of course, are that you have to identify an experimental setup. 
an experimental setup such that you actually stimulate people to escape from what it is that they uh, considered to be unpleasant. So in the case of um, uh, a peer review, uh, in my experience, when I review pap uh, papers from others, my main aim is, of course, um, to find out how um, I, get, I can help the author to escape his own framework such that he can see from the outside, maybe change it, maybe not. Um, but in any way, a peer review is a very important part of this type of experimental setup. It's also very important in terms of the way that you can say, how is it possible to get one instruction from one person shared or understood by another person? The word shared is not correct. Understood by another person. Um, so I think that my experience in peer reviews is very much that I try to falsify uh, what it is that as meaning is imposed on me, is suggested to me by the author. So those two elements constitute what I think is a very clear method, scientific method to acquire instructions, or in other words, a scientific method to acquire methods. The process can be argued in a number of ways to be scientific. It shows similarities to the scientific method that is usual in physics and biology. And it also can be argued to be a direct uh, uh, consequence of the development of uh, research methods in the past 400 years. Um, and it is that which is evolving in terms of Lutz's contribution. So that is what I would like to comment on uh, Lutz's work. First of all, I found it a bit difficult to identify uh, what he was trying to do. It is a very wide area. And secondly, I try to give uh, uh, to his work, an interpretation um, that I consider as a model of his work, such that um, that model can actually clarify what he was talking about. So that's my contribution. I, um, my interpretation involves uh, the notion that there are things, codes, if you wish, that can, develop, can be developed into uh, discursive knowledge that have a very explicit status as being not part of the traditional science, but in terms of what Lut is contributing, I think it's a major push towards understanding how important it is to be able to do research on strategies. I know that um, there are, uh, of course, uh, constraints already to do that, for example, in terms of uh, a number of these uh, developments that uh, I consider them frames. After the Second World War, we have cybernetics systems, operations research, game theory. Well, and during uh, the Second World War, all these different uh, developments and disciplinary studies actually develop a, develop a particular frame in my view, but they are all intended to serve as discursive knowledge in the form of a set of justified instructions. Well, that's my contribution. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gerard. Okay, so... Um... I'm sure there's lots of questions. There's so many um, very important points that you've raised there. Um, uh, who wants to go first? Uh, Sorry? Um, oh, well, if no oh, one- The most difficult step. 
Okay. Um, if nobody else wants to kick the start the ball rolling, I've got some questions. Mm -hmm. um, so, so Gerard, I, one of the things that you mentioned was categories. Yes. And you said that, um, I can't remember exactly how you put it, but you, you, you insisted on the importance of having categories in order to be able to establish meaning. Can, can you just explain what or how you see a category? What is a category? Yeah. Yes, of course. Um, and there are many um, uh, definitions, of course. The one that is most consistent over uh, since Aristotle is, of course, that you categorize something. For example, um, uh, uh, Aristotle tried to categorize horses and mapped all living horses onto the concept of horsiness. So a category is precisely that. It is a set of things that you map onto something else such that the something else identifies what is in the set and what is in the set identifies what, is it, what it is mapped onto. Now, the whole point that I'm trying to make is, of course, that um, in the course of time and in terms of what people like Popper have been saying, and I know I've read most of his works, I know that uh, to some extent um, he is not interested in the same things that I am, but what he identified is that the main concept that drives the notion of science in physics is the concept of a category. Mm -hmm. It means that you, in your experimental setup, identify something an object that you can observe, then you try to observe the object, then you try to identify the set of observations such that you can map it onto a single item mm. and such that the uh, mapping is exhaustive. Mm. So for example, if you want to measure something, you have to make sure that you know exactly what it is that you are going to measure and you have to make sure that the mapping is so precise that no two elements of the set have the same number. Well, they can have the same number, but um, they must be identifiable. So the concept of a category is an extremely important concept yeah. in terms of any traditional science. So anybody who says, I want to do something in culture, has the problem of identifying sets of observations um, sets of things, let me say, not to go too fast, sets of things such that you can put them together and map them. So usually people say, well, I want to map them onto a theory. And the major problem is, of course, that in uh, on the level of society and on the level of culture, there is very little that actually uh, can be mapped onto something such that the uh, mapping is exhaustive. Mm. Uh, for example, if you have a strategy, for example, I want to uh, draw a square or I want to go home. Anytime you say something like that, somebody else can add something to the set of such uh, statements. So the set is open. And you cannot categorize it. That means you have to do something else. And that's precisely what I think that Lut has done. He says what you have to do is it must be part of the process of communication okay. in a way we organize the set of non-categorizable items. Yes. So it is a grouping rather than a categorization. Okay, so I mean, within cybernetics there, and I, I guess within process theory going further back, um, there is a history of understanding categories in terms of process, in terms of continual process rather than fixed um, or, or establishable entities which are in some way mind independent. Um, and I wonder if, so I mean, I'm thinking of um, Gordon Pask, um, I guess Warren McCulloch, uh, I mean, that early paper on, um, what is it, heterarchy of values, 
Um, he's got those wonderful diagrams where he talks about the perceptual system and the environment. I think I've got them here, actually, I can show them. Um, mm -hmm. So do you see categories as existing somewhere outside a system which produces their stability? Or do you see this, this because I think what Lote is arguing is, is in that sort of process tradition, which is that categories emerge through the interactions of the cultural system. Well, <clears throat> the interactions of the cultural system, of course, are interactions and not categorizations. I mean, yeah. if it would yeah. be categorizations, there would be a stop to the process of at least a convergence. Yeah. But there are. Yeah. We step outside of whatever we have at any type of moment, at any moment, and we continue even in the same framework. So it is always possible to get something that we don't know yet, but is part of the same frame. Hmm. Pask, for example, is doing the same. Mm -hmm. He actually says the only possibility to actually group a number of experiences in a conversation is by way of the notion of entailment. Yes, I know. Yeah. So entailment is precisely what I'm talking about, but it's a special case of what I'm talking about. Yeah. Okay, this is very interesting. I'm, I, you know, ultimately you end up with some kind of metaphysics, and it's probably impossible for us to agree on what kind of metaphysics we're going to, you know, is right. I mean, it's 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 very difficult. Um, has anybody else got any comments on this? I have another comment, but uh, okay, I can. Oh, well, go go ahead. Oh, um, <clears throat> there is one um, very interesting. Uh, sentence in Lutz's work where he refers to uh, Luhmann, um, where Luhmann says, es gibt systeme. Now, there you have precisely one of the major difficulties where be, uh, that make me think that a lot of the science actually is not a lot of science at all, because uh, from Bertolanzi actually uh, introduced uh, the notion of system as something that is uh, a way of collecting something, grouping something without categorization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly, in the middle of a page, <laughs> he says, but there are systems like star systems and uh, governments and yeah. organizations. Yeah. So suddenly he jumps out of the research process and says, I have now me as a researcher identify my object without any relation to my original question. Mm. So a lot of these um, studies where they actually study um, uh, systems, to me, are not uh, scientific. And the reason that I call it a sci not scientific is, of course, not because I have the only way of talking about scientific, but um, they have a very special property. They do not introduce suddenly authority from outside. Yes. For example, um, Gerald Mitchley is very uh, much into boundary problems. Yes. And then yes. he says, I can get stockholders to help me identify what the boundary is. But that means that he is not looking for boundaries. He's looking for an authority to impose a boundary such yeah. that he can actually proceed. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that was just uh, about... I, 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 this is incredibly important and it's... Um, it, go, it goes... Well, it goes back to many of the questions you've raised, particularly about dualism and monism and... Um, yes. Um, I think the, the only thing that comes to mind is, is a, a comment that Ross Ashby made in his diary that whenever we categorize something, we throw away information. And I wonder if the choice is for us, well, which, it, how do we choose what information to throw away? What, what do we, how do we choose what to attenuate out? Because in a way, that's exactly what you're talking about, and I agree with you completely about corporate strategy and government strategy and policy and so on. Th that, those are decisions 
as to what to discard, what to ignore? Um, Again, I, I, we agree, but also we disagree. Mm -hmm. As you know, Gordon Fask was for five years a member of my staff. Yes. Uh, so a lot of uh, discussion. Um, uh, the thing is, in the way I'm talking about this, in the way I am interpreting the thing, we don't throw away information we throw away meaning hmm. if you say for example it is hot at the moment yeah <laughs> this afternoon it was 30 degrees here yeah um, you can say that's information um and then i get meaning what does what does it mean well it is an element in the process of me preparing for this uh, contribution. Mm -hmm. It is an element in the process of having another discussion tomorrow, and so on and so on. So the same element has a lot of meaning. Yeah. And when yeah. we go for meaning, we may use information to stimulate us to select meaning, but not throw it away. We never throw away meaning. Uh, sorry. Uh, information. Away information. We never do that. I mean, as scientist, and I could consider myself to be. <laughs> so, would you would you consider information to be conserved then? Well, information is something that helps you channel what you are doing. Hmm. So, for example, um, I know people who are talking about complexity. And they say, well, the universe is complex. And then I say, so what? Yeah. yeah. So the point there is that there are two sides to the same statement. OK, the universe is complex. How do I get a shortcut to realize my objectives in the universe? Yeah. yeah. So I have a very different thing. Um, I sometimes use this, uh, this example of Gauss. You may remember it, that he was asked to add all the numbers from 1 to 100. So everybody was saying, ah, this is a complex problem. 1 plus 2 is 3 plus 3 is 6. And he said, you know, the first and the last is 100, and the second and the um, next to last is 101, and so on and so on. So he found a shortcut which reduced and change the information that he used to get an inter a, a, a meaning. So his result was a different meaning, but it led to the same result. Oh, okay, I know what you, okay, yeah, very good. So in my view, the statement um, that our problem is to actually throw away uh, information is completely the wrong <laughs> statement if you want to actually um, study what is around this. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, who, who wants to um, who wants to go next? I can keep throwing questions. I've got lots of questions. Well, oh, uh, uh, of Jamie, Jamie, Jamie. Um. So first. Uh, I want to apologize. An, an extra complexity today is the refrigerator stopped working and it is also 30 plus degrees. So I have to, I, I may have to leave uh, before the end of the session. Uh, but I picked up uh, this question about categorization and um, I didn't pick up everything you said. But so the, this brings up. Uh, in your um, um, in your duality, I, I didn't hear the part uh, whether you would treat humans as the ones who are categorizing, uh, but that that there are um, there is a third element in the duality, and I call it the artifacts. And as an artifact, you can take a container and you say this is the category and and if you read that literature the word container is all over the place so now the category 
uh, I'm the one who's constructing a system of containers like a Russian doll, uh, one on top of the other in a circle, all sorts of configurations. But one can also say that in my mind, I actually use this experience of a container to create boundaries. So this is uh, the manner I'm, I'm thinking about categories like in a, in a dynamic system uh, because, because I continuously change, you change, everyone changes. And so their system of categories in their body is changing. Now we're also in a discursive process that in our writing, um, we, we introduce change. So, uh, here are, so now maybe now here is my question or something. So in this view, I kind of think of signs as that we agree on a, a common system of categories that is reproducible um by other scientists and and that that is the hallmark of science so so that by the reproducible system in the form of artifacts we are able to communicate with each other so is that what you uh how 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 would you respond to that is, is that how you think or is it like very different or how would you respond yes Thank you for asking, um, uh, especially using the term Russian doll, it's, which is interesting. I would say, uh, start out, I have a number of comments on that. I would say, to start out, that categories are not in the body, they are in the person who looks at something. So categories, in my mind, are a way of acting rather than a description of something. So you can say it has a definition, and I say, no, it doesn't have a definition. It is something that you can use to create something that has a number of properties. And one of the properties, of course, is that you know exactly what you are mapping and what you aren't mapping. Now, the major problem, uh, oh, sorry, no, in science, we very often are interested in measurement. But you can only measure um, if it is possible to identify exactly what it is that you give a certain number, such that you can actually identify the relations between the number to correspond to the relations between what it is that you're mapping. So that means that um, in science, um, this notion of the category has uh, found an enormously central role. It is, for many people, extremely difficult to get out of it. <laughs> and I mentioned already an example when I said, uh, when I talked about von Bertalanffy, he found, he noticed that he couldn't categorize systems. So what did he do? He said, well, I'll just take a star or a human or something as my system. But that is a choice. It is not something that depends on science. It depends on your experience. And that's fine in itself. I mean, I have no difficulty in historians talking about uh, historical systems. But they are very much aware that it is their choice um, identify what it is that they are studying. So, for example, <clears throat> if you are aware of this, um, I can see, for example, this is an issue that has come up in the past, with I can say, for example, ah, I is something that is going to actually stimulate the mind. But that means that you know exactly what the boundaries of the human mind are. And of course, AI has never been able to identify anything intellectually interesting without precise boundaries. That the major problem of AI is that we cannot talk about that which you are going to simulate 
in terms of a boundary set of observations per experience. So that means that to me, AI is extremely interesting. You know, I may find me there are plenty of books about it. Um, all of them identify the difficulty that AI is not about something, um, uh, that AI always has to be about something that is close. Whereas every single thing about humans actually non closed. I mean, except of course for bodies, and you can imagine it. Of course, there is boundary length. For example, love, sex, law, art. They are all things that nobody can actually um, map onto something precise like AI. Because law is something that is completely new every time somebody invents a new kind. Uh, sex, um, we know that there are lots of books about sex, but they are all instructions because nobody is able to develop a theory of sex. <laughs> I have to say, I've, I've been um, a research professor in, in architecture, and in architecture, they all talk about um, you know, science and architecture, and then they cannot identify what it is that um, you want to put into some building. What is a building that is in Kenya, for example? So these are all open questions. You cannot measure them. You cannot put them into the category. You can only group them, and by grouping them, find the frames that actually justify alternative methods. So um, a Russian doll is interesting because it actually is a set of same things in the same frame. So I found that a nice example. So in terms of AI, for example, we cannot be a member, I cannot say, now I'm going to play the role of an artificial intelligence you always have the ability to escape. So can I just ask you to clarify then? So when I mean, you've spoken about the difference between open and closed systems, when you spoke about categorization, are you are you talking about scientifically categorizable systems as closed systems? Yeah. I I didn't say actually closed systems. I uh, talked about sets. Hmm. Of course, sets can be systems when they refer to something that is a system. Good talks in the book about turns in uh, the development of society and the development of um, science. The way I see it, a uh, major turn in science was from the time that people assumed that anything that they would like to represent had to be closed in the sense that it could be mapped. And then suddenly somebody said, ah, but I can take chosen sets and I can group them in terms of, for example, rationality. I can group them in terms of entailment. And that's a very different type of thing. You cannot say that conversations are described by the theory of entailment. No, entailment is the type of thing you do to the type of thing that you collect when you study conversation. Okay. So I, 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 Jerome's got a question, but I just want to ask then if, if that process of recategorize, that process of recategorization must surely be an empirical process. You, you, you establish these categories in the light of experience in terms of actually trying these categorizations and seeing where it takes you. That is, that is an empirical process, isn't it? It is. It must be an empirical process because it's the definition of what I consider physics. Yes. So it um, must be a, anybody can, of course, say anything. Let me be very precise about that. I always enjoyed mathematics because 
you were allowed to say anything about anything. Your only responsibility was to prove it. <laughs> so when I when I raised the question, uh, this now when I when I listen to you, if if the categories do not exist in the human, um, you didn't. Maybe you did, but I didn't hear it to kind of say the human is the one who is creating the categorical system as a set of artifacts. So I, I want to hear your uh, response to, the, to, to that categorization. So the humans are creating outside the bottom, outside the body, intact, uh, this, uh, the discursive knowledge. and. And the category is there uh, in, in the form of this, this container metaphor. Uh, that is uh, number one. But I also wanted to, uh, I was curious, you talked about the I, but you never talked about the Tao uh, or the, the you or the, or the, the, the they or, or her, uh, he or she. So the third person. So, um, so that when you bring up this okay let me first stop here and and then jerome can ask his question and then i will come back because i realize i'm getting in some separate area mm -hmm. so so this is on the original question is so we create the categories a categorical system it exists outside the body exosomatic knowledge in the books as a set of artifacts is that how you look at it or how would you complement uh, my my simplistic sketch of a, of a categorical system or simplifying sketch maybe i should say as opposed to complexifying sketch well <clears throat> of course let me first say um my world, anybody can say anything. Uh, so whatever you consider a category is okay with me. But if we are using the thought concept of the science, um, then suddenly things become very different. Um, we do not create categories, but we try to identify which observations by an experimental setup and by uh, by an ordering, um, which categorizations actually exist. So, for example, I, I mentioned uh, Planck's uh, constant. Um, it maps uh, observations to such a degree that you can actually say, you know, so many decimals in the Planck constant. So that means that what it describes is very well defined. Now, if you say, how does it come that there are things in the world that can be well described? Then, of course, as I said, um, and metaphysics, and I usually leave out that answer. How is it possible that there are things that can be categorized? I don't know. But it is possible. We do it all the time. So I have a screen in front of me, and I say, for example, um, this is the category of streams, but I know very well that it cannot be close in terms of a scientific mapping. There are always different types of screens that suddenly we call a screen again, and so on and so on. So why it is that there are things we cannot um, uh, categorize, I don't know. But I do know that the type of thing that Lut is talking about include many things that cannot be categorized. So the point I was trying to make is um, that that's not really a problem. First of all, he wrote a book of it, uh, about it, and I identified a number of important points. And secondly, there are ways to deal with it in a very systematic way. The other question you asked, why do I not talk about third person? <clears throat> Actually, um, in my notes, um, I noticed that if, for example, you have a strategy to go and buy an ice cream, and I have a strategy to go and buy, let us say, a car, um, 
extremely difficult to compare and come to this strategy. There are intentions. We have intention. We have different types of resources. I need money, you need money, but much less than a car, etc. So in terms of how we deal with these strategies, we have no way to treat them as objects and say they have certain properties. The only thing we can do is to say, what do you mean by an ice cream? What do you mean by a car? So actually the process is always uh, by the two-person process of falsification. Now, you can actually have a third person, and that is, of course, precisely what Lut is introducing, which is um, a collective of people who communicate. And of course, they communicate by falsifying what each is saying to the other. So it's a very different process. Um, if you say that a Toyota, uh, I have to check. Yes, that's a categorization. There are things that are called Toyota, such that only Toyota applies to those things. Um, but there are other things like, what a nice girl or man, whatever. Um, and I can say, I don't see anything attractive. <laughs> so in the process of falsification, we do not actually agree on the framework. Thank you. Gerard. So thank you, Gerard, for this presentation. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. And it is hot as you, uh, here as well. So um, yeah. I wanted to ask maybe two related questions, and uh, Jamie or Margarita sort of preempted me here. Um, and one relates to the role of and the issue of context. Uh, now, well, I know Saul Kripke, for instance, talks about the buck stopping, and you mentioned just a minute ago this idea of, um, um, was it in categorizations, that you have certain clarity, uh, so he talks about decimals, for instance, uh, allowing for a certain higher degree of clarity in distinguishing uh, numbers, I guess. but. Um, and then also you have Lut in this chapter talking about the role of linear algebra, citing Deakin, uh, talking about or making an appeal to focus on the zeros in these um, in these matrices as being uh, conduits or vehicles for certain evolutionary processes. And my question, I guess, regards the the possibility of extending that context or the, the impossibility of extending that context. So particularly, we're talking about mathematics, natural science, physics. How do these concepts practically apply in the social uh, environment? Um, and I guess related to, to this notion of anticipation. Um, and then I guess tied to that, the, for me, very important uh, question, I guess that Jamie was getting at of ethics and even notions like the sacred. So are there limits to falsification? I'm thinking about events, historical events like Nazi experiments on human beings, you know, throwing people out of windows to see when they die. Are there limits to um, the, I guess, scientific method applying such things to um, in human societies, thinking also on this hot day about global warming, hunger, war, such, such problems? And does that bring us into territory of Levinas and this duty to, to the other? I'll leave it there. Thank you. <clears throat> Very interesting questions. Um, first about the zeros. Um, what I like in the book is that uh, Lut actually uh, makes precisely the point, so hopefully I did understand him, uh, about the zeros. What he is saying is, if you study something like, for example, uh, buildings um, or uh, photons or whatever it is you would like to study. Um, you can at a certain moment in time say, now I'm going to study this photo, photon and this house. At that moment, 
you strike through all the zeros in Lutz terminology. So what he suggests is, if you do science, you have to keep open the concept of the category that you are trying to develop, if you want to develop it, uh, because if you don't do that, um, you will be fixed by your choice. So you must actually keep open the possibility that in what it is that you study, new elements may be included. And if you don't do that, then you are outside of traditional Popperian, not traditional, Popperian knowledge. So this notion of zeros is extremely important because that's where I suddenly realized um, uh, that he actually um, is talking about the same thing as I am. <laughs> The second thing, the anticipation, that's a very important point. In traditional science, uh, physics and so on, any type of result is actually intended to make it possible to predict the future. Um, so for example, if you uh, uh, take the laws of Newton, you can predict where uh, a ballistic uh, object is going and where it uh, and how fast it uh, and so on and so on. So there is always the possibility of prediction. But the interesting thing, of course, is that in that particular process, you always need the past to predict yes. the future. It is the past that can help you. It's your resource that you can that can help you. Now, when we're talking about um, love or instructions, for example, there was a uh, there was a, a paper by uh, Baruch Fischoff many years ago, where he tried to identify a number of instructions to avoid rape. And he got 1,142 of them. So you might say that's a lot. Um, all of them actually were not predictive. So eventually one of them, just to give you an example, said in order to avoid rape, you should advise, uh, not uh, normative, you should marry. That, of course, implies that you create a resource called husband <laughs> and so on and so on. So, in fact, you must create something in the future. That's the anticipation. Eventually, um, he ended up the paper by saying, if I look at all my 1142 it's advices and instructions, I come to the conclusion that the best advice that I can give to people is be alert. <laughs> That's a very interesting concept. It says, given that be alert is part of the framework of organizing yourself such that you are resilient, that you have the resources to avoid certain things, that you anticipate certain possibilities, <coughs> contingencies, and that you put yourself into a position where you have all the resources that you deem might be necessary. So anticipation is a very important part of this whole notion of what I think discursive knowledge is. And the final thing, of course, is yes, ethics um, is one of the terms that justify a certain types of activity. For example, it's usually assumed that killing other people is not ethically justified. So if we think about it in this way, then we do have a strategy. The strategy that you might be willing to study is how to avoid killing other people in situations where you cannot avoid it, for example. So ethics becomes an extremely important, I think an extremely important area of further study, in particular in terms of uh, war. How is it that we can actually prevent um, Putin to continue the war? Now, at the moment, we only have uh, fixed strategies. Um, 
people support the Ukrainians, um, they impose restrictions, uh, but that's about it all, about all. Nobody seemed to have anticipated that Putin might actually cut off the gas uh, distribution. But now suddenly they're able to do it. Nobody seemed to have anticipated. And that's the problem where I think that uh, thinking about the present to introduce resources that you might need in the future is extremely important and very much including an ethical issue. And if you say the sacred, um, to me that's also an important point. Um, I think um, that many of the religions actually are uh, uh, groups of people who communicate in such a way that they try to identify what uh, instructions to give to other people. So in that sense, it is a process of development where continuously there are processes of falsification in between uh, discussions, etc., are taking place. And eventually the group as the group of religious people actually uh, develops itself into in a way that makes it possible to have to, um, to be identified as such a group and to have certain opinions about the sacred. So if you say, can I give you a theory of the sacred? The answer is obviously no, because the sacred can be anything. But we can prepare for the non-sacred. So in other words, you think the sacred is also a process of discourse? Yes. yes. No, no, I'm, I'm very much agree with you. I think that it usually is forgotten that we can do that uh, because many people think that churches, you know, are old fashioned, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the discussions that have gone uh, on in them are very interesting. The Talmud, for example, I read the Talmud. Um, very interesting as, a, as an example of a number of people doing um, strategic research on how to behave to other people. <laughs> Can I ask that? I think the Sorry. Quran is not the same. It, it, it only imposes constraints. Okay. So, can I can, can we dig into this word discourse then? Because um, it, it may be that there are some subtle differences in your understanding of it and perhaps Lot's understanding. Um, so, I mean, particularly, I mean, there are two two terms that sort of get bandied around. There are probably more, but but one is dialogue, and I I, I would like to think that what we do here is definitely dialogue, um, which mm. is. Uh, very much about listening and um, uh, thoughtful reflection. And the other is dialectic, which is perhaps um, a, a rather more sort of uh, um, um, antagonistic uh, uh, form of communication, but is equally important in science. Um, do you, do, how, what do you see as discourse and where do you draw the, how do you see it being characterized in terms of being dialogical or dialectical? You're asking us for, for a categorization. <laughs> well, it, well, indeed, yes, uh, perhaps. Um, well, I must admit, I didn't really uh, go into the notion of a discourse, even though I had to look it up in the like, uh, dictionaries, not because I didn't know, but um, there are so many different meanings to discourse. So when I got out of it, is that discourse is what happens in between uh, people who engage without a predefined purpose. Mm -hmm. So I think that in a sense, um, a lot of my conversations with students are discourse because I'm not trying to teach them a particular thing. I'm trying to give them a thinking of what it is to be a scientist. Yeah. Whereas a dialogue to me is usually 
uh, a channeled activity. It is um, a way of going somewhere um, and then thematically, but beyond this very general characterization, I'm unable to do. So, so if I may uh, continue in response to that earlier question, I heard you talk about the day, but not about the Tao. And so I, I can see that the I that cannot be categorized, but a Tao, and I can make a distinction between a Tao and a day. And and the Tao, I mean, dialogue with or in a discursive situation, like in the classroom. But so, uh, and a day, I think, is that I'm more likely to objectify because I'm not respect, I, 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 expecting a response. So, could you comment on that, perhaps? Uh, yes. Um return to this notion of a turn. Um, one way of dealing with the world is to search for category. And it, that is very effective and it's very useful. And one of the categories is, of course, that you make a distinction between the I and the Tao. Um, so you might say anybody who is not me is a Tao. Other possibility is that you do not try to categorize all everything, but that you realize that sometimes categorizations are not very useful, effective, appropriate, whatever it is. And that you can say, aha, um, in this particular situation, I am in a world in which now is to me an extremely important source of alternative view. So the Tao is here not just a part of a category, it is my, my world. Because in the exchange, I have a number of discussions with individuals, and it's always amazing how many interesting things come up. But not when you take the other person in, um, Category, but when you take the other, the other person as unidentified but still recognizing. Mm. Do, do you... So, <laughs> sorry, um, I was waiting. Maybe someone else wants to respond. Um, I was considering. In a in a DAO, a scientific DAO, actually, this instead of thinking of the science as a community, and then I reduce them in a in a them or a they, an object, that we are moving into a direction where as scientists we're in a feedback, feed forward engagement with DAOs, and so that we're we're like DAOs. We, we're all flipping between being eyes, trying to be good eyes and good dows. Um, but so, okay, so I, I, I would like to hear your response to that. So in that way, I, I think this of categorization as like a scientific element, as like very important to make sure we understand each other, that we we use a similar enough categorical process, or maybe that is exactly what you have been saying all along, and I'm now just uh, understanding it. Uh, yes, I think I've been saying it all along, that there is one yeah. way of treating the Tao as a them, and there is another way as treating the Tao as um, uh, part of this incredible creative uh, type of mammal, which is the human. Yeah. And so that this is what uh, sets system science separate from a system science in foreign perspective or cybernetics from traditional sociology. 
Well, it depends very much. Um, a lot of cybernetics um, hasn't been able, it, people talk about models, but they never actually create um, high quality models. They create high quality strategies to deal with a world that they think they are modeling. Well, I think, for example, at a certain moment, you are an idiot. I'm fully free to do that. As soon as I treat you as an idiot, that's very different. At no point can I say, oh, this is a categorization. I map all these people on the concept of an idiot. An idiot in Greek is an, a deviant person. It's not a dumb person. <laughs> OK. Well, Hello. go. Does someone else? Hello? No, because when you brought up the the idiot, I had to think immediately about Freud. Yeah. And the binary, the baby that looks up to someone and then has to decide itself whether it's going to be an idiot or actually the powerful person. So I find that very interesting. Uh, and how do we talk about it without, um, while making it, without doing, uh, without the unintended consequences when we actually use the word and people take it personal and the conversation that generates, yeah. Well, I would say that my experience is that um, the notion of a category um, has been a uh, part of culture for such a long period that many people cannot think outside of the notion of a category. So this whole idea, what I said, you can put things together because you think that they might be a category or because you think they might be useful, is completely alien. But it's precisely what is in the book, I think, I look, he actually, I think, <laughs> is saying, um, I don't want anything like physics or biology. There is a statement somewhere. I want something where there is interaction, communication, where there are expectations that become rationalized, in my term, become a frame, um, and so on and so on. So it means that the whole concept of humans are fixed in some sense, disappears. It is yep. a human, whatever, whatever you interact with or wish to interact with. So the notion of a human is a very different. Um, there are a number of people who have actually advocated to think in terms of, of processes. Uh, Whitehead was one of them. So some of the things that I was been talking about are white headian. Yeah. Um, had a lot of difficulty talking to other people <laughs> because they all thought that he was talking in terms of categories. Hmm. Wow. Lowell, you had a question. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate what Lute has done in developing the frame of anticipation because I think that moves us towards a more of a rigorous uh, uh, social sciences. Mm -hmm. But what I really, uh, looking at the distinction between a predictive science that measures movement, the most simple definition of science is it measures movement. I prod the animal and, and measure its jump. Uh, what I see is different in the social sciences, the ability to predict the past. The ability to predict the past means you have to understand the frames that you are categorized within, paradigms, whatever you want to say. What's important about that in a discursive knowledge, because uh, Lut really provides the interaction aspects, which is essential, not a thingness, but an interaction. It's, in, it's the in-between. But what do we mean by it in, the, in between in a social science that is descriptive, not prescriptive? 
And there, I think you have to go back to a, a seminal article of 1887 by Franz Boas in Nature, February 4th, that he said uh, it was called the study of geography. What? Very strange. But what he did there was say there are three forms of description of basically the frames within which we operate. We need to describe the human in relation to nature, human in relation to nature into human creation of the institutions, rituals, procedures, laws, etc., and the description of the cosmographic uh, theories of how you put the world together, the creation narratives, etc., And with those three forms of description, you're able to then understand a predictive pattern that you can look at something like Putin and understand what he did when he changed the color of his military uniform back to that which was the, the, the czars. The ability to look back and see where the framework puts the uh, basically range of options or the horizons of options. And, that, and there you can actually get some rigor versus trying to become a, uh, a hardened soft science or what I call the Viagra strategy of making the soft sciences hard. <laughs> so I would like to uh, see how you respond to looking at predicting the past because that requires a natural history of patterns to be able to be created, which takes Lutz anticipation into a, a paradigm that can be analyzed because you're introducing what I don't see in Lutz, time. The ability to interject time into a uh, system that plays out over a development time, over a consequence. It just, just an example, the American founders read Gibbons rise and fall of the Roman Empire. And Gibbon said he was the only real historian because he looked at patterns that followed over time. And they, the lesson for the Americans was, we better get that pattern right. Any comments on that? Predicting the past. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> first of all, I have always a little bit of a difficulty with anybody who is saying, um, you know, there are three different forms, because that implies that you refer and categorize to something outside yourself. Whereas if you say there are three different forms, it actually is part of your um, instruction, your strategy to actually look at the past and say there are three different forms. So to me, um, I am, I'm not in, um, in, in constrained by uh, the three. Um, but on the other hand, my difficulty would still be, suppose I am here, I sit here, and I would like to predict, identify a pattern in my past. I would have an incredible amount of difficulty um, what did I do an hour ago, two days ago, a year ago, three years ago, 50 years ago? Uh, the choices are incredibly wide. Now, I know that very often we develop uh, a way of looking at ourselves and we say, for example, I am this type of person. That is in itself, in itself an effort to predict your past. But in my view, it's actually a strategy to predict the future and say, um, I have shown this pattern in the past, and now you can expect me to show this pattern in the future. For example, I never cook. So, you know, somebody else has to cook. <laughs> That's my prediction. So in that sense, uh, I think that the past is an extremely interesting area because what I said about open-endedness applies especially to the past. What I was putting into it was also something about the future. We in the present create the future. So for example, I buy a bicycle. That means that in the future, I have the ability to use it. Mm. So suddenly my whole world is changed. So in that sense, I fully, understand what you're saying. Um, and there have been many people who have been uh, thinking about this type of thing. For example, Foucault. 
um, has been talking about, um, no, I forgot his tongue. Uh, but anyway, he said, you know, uh, we shouldn't look at the future. We should be looking at the things that happen together. Yes. And so in that sense, he was already identifying a method to uh, predict the past. Yeah. So, so we're very close here to um, the, the importance of Daniel Dubois to the arguments in the book about anticipation. I mean, the, the whole, this sort of rather technical thing about incursion, recursion and hyper incursion. This is very similar, it seems to me. It's very similar. And I use these concepts. On the other hand, let me be very clear. Um, I consider uh, the models that he introduces, and, and Lut is very clear about that, simply as, as toys. Yeah. You yeah. know, you want to demonstrate something, but otherwise they're yeah. completely out of this world because they don't identify what it is that you're talking about. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Jerome? <laughs> yes, I was just going to uh, somewhat polemically. Uh, or I guess less uh, polemically, but more critically respond to Lowell's contribution. Uh, because I disagree uh, to some extent with uh, what you said. Uh, the easiest thing I can disagree with is the uh, your suggestion that Lut is not considering time his, what are in the end, as we just agreed, sort of toy models or just sort of, um, what would you call this, uh, finger, finger traces in the sand, uh, one yeah. might say. <laughs> And, uh, you know, if you look at chapter eight, where he uh, is developing the theory uh, and computation of anticipations, in fact, this model does include, uh, you know, subscripts for time. Uh, and so I, it's there. So you can introduce, I guess, uh, ideas or data into that, uh, depending on which direction you're looking in. And again, this notion of hyper incursivity, I think what's interesting about it is the fact that you do have discontinuous jumps in time. So I have a lot of criticism. I mean, I'm half American. I have a lot of criticisms about uh, American political economy and the political culture in the US and how sort of backwards looking it is. And the past of the US is not so great to, to begin with. So I don't understand why you keep looking into the past of, at the founding fathers and their racism. Uh, and but that aside, um, we do live in changing times. And so looking into the past is, you know, very informative. I do it extensively and very interested in history myself, but that doesn't offer you answers to every new changing uh, scenario and conditions do change qualitatively such that you do require some new approaches. And I think this is where this notion of hyper is very interesting because you're introducing things that uh, maybe don't exist or they exist in our minds. And I'm thinking about things like science fiction, where literally you're um, fueling people's imaginations and getting them thinking and inventing and tinkering with things that in the end become real. So uh, as we discussed in one of the prior sessions, I think it was two months ago, the uh, speaker suggested there is no data for the future. So being that there's no data for the future, I'm coming from an economics background. You cannot run econometric models where you're sort of predicting what's going to happen. You have to develop new methods to uh, study what might be. And I think that Lute offers some interesting approaches Maybe they're not the right ones as to how to do this. So that's that would be my response. Thank you again. Um, one of the things that I, uh, in fact, mentioned is that, um, or what I emphasize is that the notion of culture identifies a world in which a lot of change is possible where uh, constraints can be introduced uh, to such an extent that, uh, let us say, uh, a small change today is a big change tomorrow or in 50 years. Um, so in that sense, um, I am, of course, aware that the culture is something that is a rich resource. But that doesn't mean that the uh, culture is only about the past. Um, there is a, a Greek uh, theater writer, Sophocles, 
and he has uh, written a play called Antigone. And one of the sentences in that play uh, is, um, I, I can tell you in Greek if you wish, but uh, I won't. Um, there are lots of remarkable things in the world, but the human being is the most remarkable uh, any, anywhere. Um, and I agree very much with that. And I think that people actually very often uh, imprison themselves by thinking in terms of categories, by thinking in terms of, I need the past to help me predict the, uh, the future. Whereas I say, yes, that's very good. I mean, I have, have been trained as an econometrist as well, um, but I never could understand why I would predict with 600,000 variables. My teacher was Jan Tinberg, and he had a model and he used six variables and he did the same. Um, so that brought me into this whole area where I say, clever people are able to actually think of shortcuts. His model was a shortcut compared to all the other models. And I think that is what we forget. People are able to think of shortcuts going beyond the clearly visible experience, etc. Now, where you get this inventiveness is, of course, not very clear. Yeah. And Sobotnes didn't mention it. <laughs> but at the same time, he pointed out something um, that I think is, is so remarkable, and it's represented in Lutz's work uh, whenever he is talking about partaking, interacting, um, uh, uh, developing, evolving, etc. So to me, the past is, yes, important. I mean, how would I know how to uh, put uh, uh, a bookcase together? But on the other hand, how would I think to put together, let us say, a flying machine? I mean, if I would be the brothers, right? So yes, I agree with you that from the past, we can have via different predictive models, um, a good, sometimes a good idea of what is going to be. I mean, the, the, uh, the interest rates are developed on the basis of uh, models. But at the same time, sometimes people say my intuition, and intuition is of course, the creative moment where you say, all the models tell me to do this, but I think I should be doing that. Yeah, but there will so, be a model telling you to do that as well, won't there? Well, in the end, of course, yes. If you learn from me, yes, then you will. Yeah. Boolean algebra is a way of doing things that was not before Boo. Mm. Yeah. And now yeah. it is used. He bought a house in Lincoln where he lived. What more? Klaus. Well, there was so much said, and I'm not so sure if I, I, what I can contribute. But let me start saying um, the issue of categories. Do they exist? Do they exist outside? No. They exist in discourse, only in discourse. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, when you think of uh, we relate, of course, in discourse to things other than what we're talking about. Uh, give me, a, a, you, you, you describe the categories as basically sets of elements. But this is a very strange conception. Think about, for example, the category of birds. Well, there are lots of kind of birds. When you, when you ask someone, what is a bird? Then you get actually a prototype in your mind maybe something like a, a sparrow. And you don't get this, the, for example, the penguin. And that is a kind of scientific categorization that you put the penguin together with a, with a swan, et cetera, et cetera. So I think categories are part of discourse and they are, they are evolving in the conversations that are going on. So, but I think I wanted to talk about uh, briefly uh, the, the, my main contribution that I see here in, uh, for me, at least in Lloyd's work, is the issue of meaning and anticipation. And I actually never thought about that in this term. What is meaning? 
And I, I think there's a big mistake to confuse meaning with information. Um, mm. when, you, when you think of information, it's always about something. And if you look at information theory, there's always the issue of coding. That means what a current kind of signal uh, relates to something else. But that is not meaning. Uh, if you think of meaning, um, I, I would say always meaning has something to do with the narrative that you can make around it. You know? yeah. So I, I think uh, uh, when, 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 let's say the meaning of my job, well, it is what, what I'm telling myself is useful, what is good, et cetera, et cetera. Now, and that's, that is very much related to anticipation, not to prediction, and not the prediction of the past or not the prediction of the future, but to, to what is going on right now and what I'm going to do. And I think they, they, to me, that is an important uh, thing that, that came to me clear with Lord's work. I, I am not sure if I, if I like the uh, codification of meaning in terms of mathematical functions. That is, I think, uh, going too sidewise of, of the issues. But I think the issue of anticipation, it has to do with not necessarily prediction in science, yes, but not in everyday life, not in communication. So I, I, I would like to put that out there as, as a, to go back maybe to more what, what Lord's uh, contribution is uh, to me at least, is the issue of um, what is meaning. And I'm not so sure if one, if one can describe meaning so simply as, an, as a sociological category. Although, of course, the coordination of different kinds of narratives that people engage in, in, in their own life, in organizing their lives, in talking about it, that is clearly sociological. But, it, but it, one has to be careful not to confuse those things. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> it allows me to clarify a number of things. I would say that <clears throat> one of the uh, my slides said that meaning is the central concept in sociology, but it was Lumen's uh, um, name. What I was saying is something else. Um, we, as humans, have the ability to create narratives and thereby bring together certain types of um, uh, elements like birds, for example, um, even though we also can categorize birds, but you know as well as I do that the categorization of birds as a scientific category has not succeeded. Um, there are always types of mammals and types of dinosaurs where it is not very clear uh, that they are birds. Some birds cannot fly, so they do not satisfy that criteria. What is the criterion? Uh, sometimes um, DNA makes it possible to claim that there are sufficient similarities to actually identify um, a number of birds as belonging to the same category. But as a category, it is not a theory. It doesn't allow you to predict any new type of bird. And therefore, the concept of bird is not a category, and it should help you to predict. So I fully concre uh, agree with you that mathematical models have the tendency to close people's minds. They think that they are talking about something in reality, whereas they only are talking about the model. And the model is not reality, as Kaczynski said. So the whole point about what we are talking about is that um, Lut, in my view, didn't say we have to look at meaning independent of um, information. What he said is there are situations where information actually helps to create meaning in such a way that the meaning is new and actually helps you to introduce into the world new tools, new possibilities, new relations, etc. So in my view, I actually completely agree with you that prediction um, is a concept from science, the traditional form of science, and you will find it in nearly all the handbooks I have checked. 
that prediction is the criterion for science. And what I claim is there is such a lot in the world that you can study um, rigorously, scientifically, without needing the concept of a category, but where you do need the concept of grouping. As Pask was saying, entailment is a grouping. And I, I would like to just make a, a minor comment. I have a lot of Chinese students, and I'm amazed how different the language of, in China is from us. And there are other areas where, for example, categories don't mean a thing. But uh, you mentioned actually at some point the process. You know, that, that there is something to be said that maybe categories fix one to some to to the, our Western notion of using nouns. Mm. And that is not uh, that has nothing to do really with knowledge rather than it has to do with the commitment to a particular form of discourse. So I mm. think one has to be careful not to say categories are it or something. It, that that is really to me quite meaningless. But I must correct you in, a, in, in one sense. I haven't said that categories are a core concept. I have said that categories are one of the most misused uh, concepts. Um, and I make a distinction between people who do science. I don't know when you do science, but you may be aware that you study systematically. And all those people actually um, well, look at the papers uh, that they write. They all try to describe a well-defined domain. Now you can say, uh, okay, they are uh, at home. They are normal people. Will they do the same at home? I don't know. What I'm saying is that categorization is an extremely central concept in research. It may be also at home and in daily life. Uh, all my girlfriends are two meters tall. Well, that's a categorization for me personally. But if I would be a scientist, I would say, can I find a girlfriend who is not two meters tall? That would be, for me, the test. So for me, the work of loot has nothing to do with uh, meaning on sick, uh, uh, on, on sick. Uh, it has to do with the possibility of making a link between something in reality that happens as information, and then the question is, and what does it do to me? It allows me to make something of a set, but not a set that is a category, but a set of things that I can actually group. So in the process of making that set, I must test again and falsify whatever doesn't belong to the group. Mm. That's what we all do. I mean, birds are a typical example. They are not a category, but they are grouped. Okay. <laughs> Jamie? You mean, you yeah, mean you perhaps as a, as a closing question, I heard you say in response to reading Lude's book and, and kind of saying, I don't know. It, it was somewhere, it was about how do you deal with, with certain pieces of information that Lude gave us that you say, this is not science. And now the question is, so if it's not science, what is it? And then you said, I don't know. And so I'm wondering, how would you advise people when they come up against something that they say, actually, I'm not really sure. So there's another way of saying, I don't know. How would you recommend we, we pursue in a, in a systematically meaningful, um, meaningful scientific way? Let me emphasize again that I am not um, a definitionalist. I do not define things as if they are true. Um, I identify things that might be interesting to get it. Now, uh -huh. suppose um, 
I have to, so no, no, no. suppose somebody comes to me and says, you know, I have a problem. Um, I don't have enough money to eat. Now you might say, well, um, the obvious solution is of course, to actually get some food to that person. It is, as it were, the categorization of the problem in terms of missing resources. But there is another way of interpreting it and saying, yes, if there are resources missing, why don't I help this person to get an education, to get a job, to get a house, whatever it is. So um, in many situations, we do know that some ways of hand acting are wrong. In such a situation, I would advise those people not to focus on what they think they should be doing, but to focus on alternatives, to make it possible to create a frame in which they can choose alternative activities and maybe compare them by actually exploring in experimental setups, which one is the best. So, you know, I understand um, that maybe I can summarize a little bit. Um, what I try to do is to actually make a claim that is that Luke's work is not only uh, concerned about the application of uh, Shannon's uh, of information, but it turns out, in my view, that he actually identified an area of possible scientific insight that is completely unexpected. And he introduced a number of the methods to do that, but I gave additional methods to make it more precise. Mm -hmm. Yes, and and I heard you say very clearly, so when that I don't know comes up, yeah, maybe I didn't hear it, uh, maybe I misheard, but you said, I, I set up an I set up some experimental context and that probably involves other people and so then I find out an answer. So that is... Um, to become more resilient. Yes. Um, Not to solve a problem. But first the experimental setup to understand better and then, and then see what happens. Yeah. Mm. Well, that's, a, that's a very good point to, um, to close. Um, Gerard, thank you so much. This has been so um, provocative and um, well, thought provoking and provocative. Um, and uh, I think um, it, it's sort of it's it's so good to hold up these different mirrors to to what Lot has written. Um, and, and this has been a particularly interesting, fascinating mirror. So so thank you. Um, Jamie, what do we have next coming up in August? Uh, next in August, we have the closing session and it's uh, summary and conclusions, uh, the socio-cybernetic of scientific knowledge, synergy in the triple helix, anticipatory dynamics and, and simulations. And then against monism is the very last uh, subsection. Mm -hmm. And we have two people commenting one is Lucio, uh, and the other who is here now, and the other is Jerome. And uh, so they already presented, but then they're going to add uh, additional insight and uh, and give us a wrap up, uh, I guess. So um, I look forward to seeing you all uh, the third week of August. Okay. And let me look up the date precisely i had uh, given the wrong day today that is uh is the 17th it's on a wednesday it's always the same day of the week same time wherever you are in the on our planet all okay. right all right well thank you very much and um and we'll see you next time
Okay. Bye bye. Very nice. Bye bye. Thank you. Uh, J Thank Jamie, you are you coming to Liverpool? Uh, yes, I'm coming. I was going to send you a little message. Okay. Uh, I will be there probably Tuesday morning. So when are are you going to be there? I, 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 I'm not sure yet, but I'll be there. Yeah, because I I decided to come maybe a day earlier so that I hopefully can meet with as many people outside the conference as possible. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, it'll be going nice to a Beatles to revival. Sorry, no, it's not a beef. No, this is this is interesting. So if anyone's in the vicinity of Liverpool, I'm just looking to see if there's an online. So this is the Spencer Brown Laws of Form Conference. Um, this is the website. Um, it's free if you want to attend uh, personally. Um, and I'm just looking to see as uh, um, Stephen Wolfram is giving the keynote. This is courtesy of uh, Lou Kaufman, I think, who's organized that. Um, Lou is talking, um, and I'm just looking to see. Yes. Is there an online yes. link? I, I apologize. I was uh, responding. I apologize. I was responding to someone in the house. So I didn't hear the question, uh, Mark. Sorry, I can't remember what the question was. Excuse me again, I was yelling to someone. Uh, so, Gerard, I will be in Belgium in, in the during the first week of August, and, and I don't know exactly how my schedule is evolving, uh, but I found your presentation fascinating, and maybe I'll, I'll drop by in Amsterdam. 